Hello and thank you for joining us for Beyond Your Service Here, Project Sustainability Strategies. I'm Andy King, a training specialist with the Corporation for National and Community Service. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Also joining us are Bethany DeSoblin and Sam Graziani from Education Northwest and JBS. They are our producers and are managing the technology today. You'll see Bethany and Sam in the chat and the Q&A to help make sure you get your questions answered or to provide technical help if you need it during the session. And now I'd like to welcome our presenters for today's webinar. We're delighted to have with us Sarah Gleason. Sarah serves as a consultant and facilitator, and she's worked with the Corporation for National and Community Service, as well as Peace Corps, and along with a variety of nonprofit, government, and community-based organizations. She's part of the VISTA PSO, or Pre-Service Orientation Facilitation Team. So you may have met Sarah at a PSO. And she's also trained VISTA supervisors. Additionally, Sarah has herself supervised VISTA members. So she has a lot of knowledge and experience to share with us. Later on, we'll hear from two guest speakers from the Emmaus Rebuilding Lives program, Gretchen Arnst and Katie Berry, to hear how they have been building sustainability into their work. But first, I'll provide a snapshot of what we plan to cover today. By the end of today's webinar, we'd like you to be able to define sustainability within the VISTA context. We also want you to be able to define VISTA member and VISTA supervisor roles and to recognize how VISTAs and supervisors can support each other to achieve sustainability within the VISTA project. Further, we hope you'll identify some specific practices that you can implement that can lead to VISTA project sustainability and that you'll learn to develop a plan for project sustainability. And finally, we'd like you to be able to identify existing resources that can support you in your sustainability efforts. And as mentioned early, earlier on, we'll have time for your questions, so we hope that you'll get the answers that you're looking for. And with that introduction, I'm going to pass this on over to Sarah Gleason. Sarah? Hey, thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. This is Sarah, and as Andy mentioned, I work and volunteer with many different nonprofit and community-based and government agencies here in Minnesota, which is where I am. And I'm glad to be here today because I've seen the difference that VISTAs can make, and I'm passionate about making sure that that impact is long-lasting. We know from our experience that VISTAs, like you, are eager to talk about sustainability, and I've seen that in the chat. You all have some great wisdom about this. We've heard from VISTAs in the past that they want to understand the broader impact of their activities on the overall agency goals and on program sustainability, that it's helpful to hear tips on helping to transition a new VISTA or staff person or a volunteer into current community relationships and that they want concrete examples of ensuring sustainability. And we are going to do our best to touch on all of these today. So we're going to start with a definition. I saw some great ones coming through on the chat before we got on. Um, but this on the screen is what we mean by sustainability in the VISTA context. Sustainability is the ability of a program or an organization to continue engaging community stakeholders to meet the needs of the community efficiently and effectively through potentially changing circumstances and changing sources of support after the departure of the last VISTA member. And while you as VISTA members have an important role to play in supporting and strengthening the sustainability of your program or organization, remember that the overall responsibility for program sustainability lies with the staff of your sponsoring organization. They have a longer term, bigger picture view of the program, and ideally, they will have designed your VISTA project and your assignment description with sustainability in mind from the beginning. But even so, uh, I do want to spend a couple minutes painting a picture of what overall program sustainability looks like. Uh, in general, we think about nonprofit and community-based programs, they need 
four kinds of capacity to support sustainability. And we've shown them here as legs of a stool. So we've got program capacity, which is all about effective programs that are making a demonstrable difference and addressing real community needs. There's communication capacity, which is about being able to tell your story effectively in order to engage and maintain support. The human capacity, effective and empowered staff and volunteers. And the fourth leg is often the one that we think of first when we talk about sustainability, which is financial capacity, meaning that you've got sufficient financial resources and that they're coming from a diversity of sources. And we painted this picture as a stool because just like a real four-legged stool, all four legs of the stool have to be strong enough to support the program's sustainability. If any one leg is too weak, the whole stool will fall down. And there's one more piece of this. As you can see in the image, connecting and strengthening these four legs of the sustainability stool are engaged and empowered community members and organizational stakeholders. Their support is crucial to sustainability. They're the ones, really, that hold it all together. As I mentioned earlier, VISTA projects are developed with a goal to phase out the need for VISTA members. That's why your assignments are focused on strengthening the capacity of your sponsoring sites while engaging community members and partners to ensure that the project can run by itself after you're gone. And every VISTA project plan actually includes some of the thinking and planning around sustainability that came even before you arrived on site. When your sponsoring organization applied for VISTA support and completed the plan, there's a section called Community Strengthening where program sustainability is described. And I hope it's already clear to you how sustainability and capacity building are linked. You and your projects are building the capacity that supports program sustainability. As a VISTA member, you're working to create or expand or strengthen an organization's systems or processes and to engage and empower community members and organizational partners, enabling the organization and the community to sustain program activities once the VISTA project ends, which is what sustainability is all about. So in this big picture of sustainability, everybody's got a role to play. Your organization and your community partners are responsible for envisioning the future of the project, for creating and engaging a community advisory board or similar kind of stakeholder group, for creating and implementing a sustainability plan and orienting you as VISTA members and subsites if you've got them in your project to that sustainability plan. While you, as you know, are building the capacity of the organization and the community, supporting sustainability through your assignment, your assigned activities, engaging staff and community in and through those activities, and of course, transferring the knowledge and products and relationships that you develop. We've heard also from both VISTA members and supervisors that they wanted to understand better uh, how AVISTA's activities relate to the larger goals of their organization. And as, we've, as we're going to see in a few minutes, this alignment is actually a key factor in sustainability. As I noted a moment ago, every project submits a project plan as part of their application that outlines, along with sustainability, how this project will fit with national goals and agency goals. So we're going to just take a quick look at an example of how this might look for a mentoring program. And you may remember this example from your PSO. So in this example, the national goal is to provide support or facilitate access to services and resources that contribute to improved educational outcomes. And the agency goal, supporting that national goal, is to improve educational and behavioral outcomes. This VISTA project's goal is to ensure that the children of incarcerated parents receive the educational, social, and emotional support they need through engagement with a mentor. 
And the VAD goal for this particular VISTA is to develop sustainable volunteer recruitment and management systems for that mentoring program. So the VISTA's activities to reach this goal are to create outreach systems, develop targeted marketing materials, and enhance the current mentor training. Building the ability of the organization to keep that human capacity leg of the sustainability stool strong. So, that theory sounds good, but does it work in reality? Well, uh, in 2010, a large-scale study looked at VISTA projects after their VISTAs were gone. And it found that, in fact, yes, the vast majority of programs supported by VISTA continued working to address the needs of the community after the last VISTA was gone. So we've got here a few highlights from that report. Um, the study found that 84% of VISTA projects were still operating three years after the departure of the last VISTA. And more than 90% of those had achieved their three most important project goals. And you'll be pleased to know that the project directors or staff from more than 90% of those projects reported that VISTA members were critical or very helpful in achieving project goals. Let me not stop for a moment and ask you to weigh in here. And we want your comments to be visible to everyone, so please be sure to enter them in the chat panel, not the Q&A panel further down the screen, and to send it to all participants. So here's the question. What kind of variables do you think make a difference in a project's ability to be sustainable after the VISTAs have left. All right, well, we've got responses coming in already. Um, folks are talking about um, Volunteer recruitment strategies or approaches, um, having community buy-in, which of course is essential to the success of a project, uh, short or long term. Um, vision, making sure that you know what it is you're trying to accomplish, where it is you're heading, um, project goals as well. Um, things like communication and funding, um, having supervisors support um, and, and perhaps staff support throughout the organization, um, providing training. Um, again, community involvement, community empowerment. Um, wow, they're coming in so fast now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so lots of, um, lots of folks are sort of um, emphasizing and, and reiterating um, some of those key thoughts about uh, community and stakeholder involvement and, and awareness, um, being clear about your mission and vision and goals. Um, and then uh, having people internally on board. So, Sarah, what stands out for you in that long list? Well, uh, I, what stands out for me is that you did nice work. You hit on most of what actually this study found about what made VISTA projects sustainable or not sustainable. So uh, you'll see the right here is confirmation of that in the study. The most important variables cited were, and these are in order of importance, first off, the capacities and training and dedication of VISTA members. And I heard this from a number of you, the support of the project from the community at large. Uh, one that we often don't think about is sort of the age of the organization and the organization's experience with this kind of project and the centrality of the project's goals to the mission of the organization, which is very similar to what some of you were saying there. And if we flip it around and look at it the other way, we also see confirmation of a number of things that you mentioned. Staff of the organizations with projects that were not sustained most often gave uh, some reasons that will be coming up on the slide in a moment. First of all, poor organization management or poor project management, a lack of needed resources, and that could be funds or volunteers or both, a lack of community support, the flip side of what we said about variables for sustainability, or a lack of organization support. So again, that's just the flip side. 
And in some other cases, we had the study found projects that had met all of their goals and objectives and that that was the reason that they ended. So I want to just point something out. Notice that the reasons, all of the reasons listed on this slide for programs not being sustained involve exactly the kinds of capacity that VISTA members are often assigned to build. Internal systems and processes for management, volunteer and financial resources, and community and organizational support. So I think this is really just solid confirmation that VISTA members can have a profound effect on sustainability. So let's wrap up our discussion of this big picture of your program's sustainability with some questions for you to consider. First of all, do you know who's responsible for the big picture of sustainability for your program? This might be your supervisor or your project director or someone else in the organization. As we've noted, most VISTA assignments focus on building capacity in one or more focus area, while there are other people that are working on other legs of the sustainability stool. So a question for you is, do you know who's responsible for the other legs of your program? If you're working on volunteers, who's working on communication? Do you know if there's a plan already in place for ensuring the sustainability of your program? If you don't already know the answers to these questions, well, especially if you're a person who likes to understand the big picture, I suggest you work with your supervisor to find the answers. The project plan can be a good place to start. Now we're going to focus really the rest of our time on the future of your capacity building work after you are gone. Ask yourself, do you know who will carry on your work? Who will use or work with or rely on the knowledge and systems and products and relationships you're building? This might be another VISTA or someone in your organization or volunteers or other community stakeholders. Uh, if you'll notice, we've opened a poll on the right side of the screen that focuses on that question. Take a moment to respond now if you haven't yet. Pretty simple. You'll pick yes if you do know who will be carrying your work forward, and pick no if you don't know yet. And while we're waiting for everyone to respond to the poll, here are a couple of other questions to think about. Once you know who will carry on your work, how will you ensure that these people understand and are capable of using or working with the knowledge and systems and products or relationships that you're building? How will you ensure that leaders in your organization and your community understand the value of what you're building and are committed to carrying it forward? We're going to give you a few more minutes to tell us your answers to the poll question while you think about those other questions. Okay, we got some results. So for those of you who did respond to this poll, it looks like you're split about half and half between folks who can identify now who that is and those of you who don't yet know who it is that's going to be carrying on your work. Uh, I would just say that wherever you are in your year of service, it is never too early to start thinking about and making a plan for how you're going to pass it on when you leave. A plan can be a powerful tool to ensure that your work this year has long-lasting impact after you're gone. If you haven't yet, now is the right time to work with your supervisor on a plan for transferring the capacity that you're building during your years of service, your year of service, excuse me. You may do more than one, but I'm really only talking about this one right now. Your supervisor can be a guide, can be a partner, a resource to support you in developing a plan. You can work with them to identify sustainability objectives, to identify milestones, marking your progress on the path to those objectives, to identify a timeline for reaching those objectives. 
and to identify activities and practices that will get you to those objectives. And once you've identified those activities, to decide who will be responsible for the activities you've identified. You may determine that some activities are appropriate for you as a VISTA member to carry out, while others may be more appropriate for a VISTA supervisor or another organization staff person to implement. For example, and this obviously depends on your organization, but it may be more appropriate for a supervisor to take the lead on activities like advocating for a program with organization leadership, board presentations, strategic planning, or working with human resources or IT staff, if you have them, on systems changes. We'll give uh, a bunch of concrete examples shortly about kinds of activities that other VISTAs are doing that might make sense for you to take on. And finally, make a plan with your supervisor to assess your progress toward those objectives, not just your VAD objectives, but your sustainability objectives as well, by checking in regularly and adjusting the plan as needed. And there are lots of resources out there to help you with this, with planning as well as with sustainability. There are a number of resources on the VISTA campus. Uh, we've listed a few of them here, starting with the Project Sustainability Assessment Checklist to promote sustainable VISTA projects that was developed by a group of VISTA leaders and covers a wide range of topics. Other resources on the campus include uh, something called Capacity Building in Action that can help you better understand capacity building. There is Passing the Torch, Ensuring the Continuity of Your Work, which is a recorded webinar on this topic that includes some examples of some of the tools for passing on your work. Strengthening Your Organization, Your Community, and Your Projects is an online course on asset-based community development with tools for understanding and documenting community assets. Creating a binder for the next VISTA. That's a slide presentation, again, created by a VISTA leader with lots of great ideas. And there's also a recorded webinar on the campus that isn't actually on the slide called Building Sustainability into a Volunteer Program that those of you supporting volunteer programs may want to check out. If you can also find external resources, obviously, that are helpful in assessing or planning for program sustainability. Uh, the web-based resources listed here are not endorsed by the Corporation for National and Community Service, but are simply examples of other tools available. The first one, that Program Sustainability Assessment Tool, or PSAT, was originally developed for public health programs, but can easily be used by any kind of community-based program. Uh, the website has great free resources to help you understand and assess and develop an action plan for sustainability at the program level. And if you're thinking about sustainability at the organization level, the last resource on the slide is a learning guide and a set of tools from the Community Foundation of Jackson Hole, which focuses on high-level elements of organizational sustainability, like organizational vision and governance. Okay. So uh, I think it is time now to change things up a bit and give you a chance to hear from some folks who are putting sustainability into practice in the field. All right, and our example from the field uh, comes from the Emmaus Rebuilding Lives Program, which is an AmeriCorps VISTA sponsor located in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Gretchen Arnst is the VISTA supervisor at Emmaus. Uh, she has spent more than 30 years fighting poverty and seeking social justice for disenfranchised adults and children. Gretchen was a founding board member of Emmaus and now serves as its director of philanthropy. It's in this role that she oversees the organization's successful Rebuilding Lives AmeriCorps VISTA project. Katie Berry was placed with Emmaus for her year of VISTA service uh, from August 2014 until August of 2015. During this time, she helped establish the successful Emmaus Explorers Program for school-aged homeless youth. 
Katie was so successful as a VISTA that Emmaus hired her to serve as the program developer for both Emmaus Explorers and a similar enrichment program for homeless parents. Katie is also currently pursuing a master's degree in public health at Boston University, and she plans to join the Peace Corps upon completing her degree. So now let's hear from Gretchen Arnst. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to just give you some context for our projects, so I want to give you a brief description of our organization. Emmaus was founded in 1985 by a group of concerned citizens here in Haverhill, Massachusetts. I happen to be one of them myself. I was working as executive director of a youth-serving organization at the time. And over the past 30 years, we've been able to help approximately 27,000 adults and children overcome homelessness and reach their fullest potential. Um, our organization's services range from emergency shelter to permanent affordable housing. We are a nonprofit housing developer and we own and manage 93 units of permanent affordable housing for single adults and formerly homeless families. Um, right now, today, we're going to focus on one project that's been a result of our fabulous AmeriCorps VISTA Rebuildings Lives project. We have hosted 15 VISTAs since 2009, and the team that served from August 2014 to August 2015 launched the Emmaus Explorers program. So I want to turn it over to Katie Berry, who is a VISTA alum, as was just said, and is now working here part-time as a program developer while she's in graduate school. So Katie, why don't you tell everyone about the Explorers program? Awesome. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. Um, as you guys heard from Gretchen, Emmaus does an incredible job of providing housing and shelter to over 300 people each night. However, during my year of service at Emmaus, Two other AmeriCorps VISTAs and I noticed a lack of targeted programming for children living in the Emmaus Family Shelter. To fill this gap, we came up with the idea to develop a summer enrichment program for homeless children and their families. We, la we launched the Emmaus Explorers program during the summer of 2015. The primary goal of Emmaus Explorers was to create a positive, safe environment for the educational and personal development of these youth. As VISTAs, we wrote the original grant for this project and received funding from the Massachusetts Service Alliance, which is the state's commission on service and volunteerism. Our VISTA team also planned the curriculum, recruited volunteers, marketed the program, coordinated donations, and established community partners to support the Emmaus Explorers program. Program activities, which were led by Emmaus staff and a team of enthusiastic, dedicated volunteers, included educationally themed camp sessions, family enrichment events, and field trips. My year of service came to a close about the same time as the summer session of Emmaus Explorers, but the program did not end there. A second team of three AmeriCorps VISTAs that started in August have helped the program expand to include after-school programming in both the fall and the spring. As a result, children in the family shelter now have a place where they can go after school where they can get one-on-one -on -one assistance with their homework and participate in fun educational activities with their peers. Personally, I have also been lucky enough to continue working with Emmaus Explorers as the program developer during this transition, and it has truly been a joy to watch the program grow in just one year from an initial idea to an integral permanent part of the services that Emmaus offers. I am now proud to announce that Emmaus will be launching a new program this summer built entirely off the success of Emmaus Explorers. The program will empower homeless parents, primarily single mothers, to cope with trauma-related stress, build self-esteem, define their aspirations, and embrace their inner strengths. Together with Emmaus Explorers, this new program will enrich the lives of those living at the Emmaus Family Shelter and help these families foster the self-sufficiency needed to move out of Emmaus and into their own homes. And it all started with the ideas of just three AmeriCorps VISTAs. This project was easily the highlight of my year of service, thanks to the massive impact that I've been able to witness um, that it's had on the lives of families in the family shelter at Emmaus. I would like to hand things back over to Gretchen, who can share some details of this impact. Thank you, Katie. Um, our 
2015 program that included both the summer program and the fall after school program served 50 children from 34 families. To give that some context, our family shelter serves up to 54 families at any given time, and that includes people with infants and people with children who are teenagers. This program targeted school-age kids from 5 to 12 years old. And serving 50 children was really quite an accomplishment. Um, homeless families tend to be a hard population to engage in programming. They're under a tremendous amount of stress, they're victims of trauma, and they're living in a shelter. So their minds really aren't on a lot of enrichment programming for their kids. You know, they're really concerned about where they're going to land next. There's a lot of pressure on them to figure out their next steps, to find housing. So to engage 50 kids from 34 families was tremendous, and especially when we compare it to similar efforts we've made in the past where we have not had these kinds of outcomes. So we were thrilled with the participation rates. The program partnered with 13 community organizations, and again, to put this into context, Haverhill is a city of 65,000, so we're not in a major metropolitan area, so partnering with 13 community organizations was a big number, and we engaged 73 volunteers in over 1,200 hours of service. And this is probably the most important piece here for sustainability purposes in this discussion, we created three replicable programs. Um, our VISTA team, Katie and the other two VISTAs, were really mindful right from the beginning to create curriculums that could be used again so that we wouldn't be reinventing the wheel this summer or this coming fall. So we've actually created three modules now. Last summer was Learning is Fun, and it was um, a more intense program because it was during the summertime when kids weren't in school, so they met three times a week for three hours each time for sessions, and they covered art, music, they did um, health and wellness, as well as reading and math. Again, this connects into the fact that outcomes for homeless children in school tend to be, they're, they're lagging far behind their peers, their non-homeless peers. So we really were trying to address that in the summer program. The fall session was building community, um, and we brought in a lot of community partners, including the YMCA, a local karate studio. We had um, an urgent care medical facility, do a teddy bear clinic with the kids. So we, we wanted to really introduce them to people in their community, sort of in their neighborhood, who because their lives have tended to be isolated and they're not really integrated into a community, they may, may not feel comfortable with the firefighters or the local police or going to the doctor's office. So we thought this would be a great way to make them feel part of something bigger than their family unit, which has been fractured by homelessness. And finally, this spring, we've had a session on exploring the arts. And that's been a lot of fun and, you know, really great in terms of helping the kids express themselves through, through music, art, and theater. So those are the three replicable programs that we have created. Um, this spring, what was really also key to the, to the sustainability of this program, when we applied for additional funding from the Massachusetts Service Alliance, Katie, our current VISTAs, and myself designed a volunteer leadership program. And basically, the leadership program was taking volunteers who had been tremendous in this program and elevating them to be session leaders. So instead of relying on staff to be running the activities, we would prepare the youth, youth and adult volunteers to be the leaders of each session. And it was a leap of faith, to be honest with you, but Katie and um, our, one of our current VISTAs, Lindsay, did a tremendous job designing and creating this wonderful training brochure booklet, really, a big book full of training materials, including activity banks. So
So if a volunteer was stuck and didn't know what to do for a certain session, they had different categories in the back of the book where people could go to look for activity ideas, and they were tremendous. And, and from there, that was a stepping stone for them creating their own activities and developing their own ideas and launching their own program activities. And that really, the volunteer leadership program, we engaged the local community college, they brought in a professor who did a unit on multiple intelligence and behavior management for kids, and that was tremendous. So we armed our volunteers to be successful. We prepared them to be successful, and they have not disappointed us. They have been tremendous. So this coming summer, as Katie mentioned, we'll be piloting similar programs for homeless mothers and other homeless adults who we serve in our programs. And that's going to be called the Duville Empowerment Project. And I have really exciting news because starting in August, we have two new VISTAs coming in, one for the Emmaus Explorers Program to be dedicated to all aspects of that project and one for the Duville Empowerment Project. And so while we're not saying goodbye to VISTAs yet, thankfully, we are constantly thinking about sustainability and creating this program. And, you know, we know at some point we will need to say goodbye to the VISTAs and we're prepared for that and we're already mindful of the need to build in sustainability in everything we do. So Katie, I want to um, put it back to you. We would like to give you some sustainability tips that we've identified and Katie will start off with that. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, yeah, I would love to share some of the experiences that I've had and the lessons we've learned through the development of this project that might help you guys, as this is, create similar sustainable projects that will be able to continue when your year of service ends. Uh, first, I think it's really important to have an intentional focus on sustainability throughout the design and implementation processes. From the very beginning of Explorers, my team really tried to design things with sustainability in mind. We wanted Emmaus to be able to continue the program with ease beyond our service and without the support of future VISTAs. To do so, we kept detailed binders of the curriculum and program materials. We had one massive one that uh, had really detailed accounts of the day-to-day -day activities. We had another binder um, that had all of the marketing materials and another binder that had all of our um, community partners and volunteer information. Uh, we also established Excel databases for the community partners, donors, and volunteers. Additionally, all marketing materials and program application materials were designed as templates that could be easily used in the future with only minor adjustments to things like dates and a, few, a little bit of the wording. Um, second, I think uh, that it's really important to create replicable projects along the same lines as uh, an intentional focus on sustainability. Uh, my team of VISTAs, as well as the three who are currently uh, serving, have designed each Emmaus Explorer's term, summer, fall, and spring, to function as independent units, as Gretchen mentioned. So each summer, we can just pull out these binders and refer to these databases and very easily run a similar program. Uh, so this summer, kids will be doing very similar activities as last summer, and we will capitalize on prior community partnerships to plan enrichment events and field trips uh, that are very similar to the things that we did last summer um, in order to minimize the work and ensure sustainability. Third, um, I think it's important to consider the context of the project and align plans with your organization's mission and strategic goals. After planning sessions with Gretchen and our executive director, we are able to create a program that reflects Emmaus' goals. Over the past few years, Emmaus has been shifting towards a model that caters towards helping families cope with trauma and build self-sufficiency before they can be expected to find employment or go back to school. Homelessness is a massive trauma, um, and a lot of times these people have really difficult lives and they can't be expected to, you know, they barely have shelter, and yet they're often expected to find jobs or pursue work immediately or uh, focus on going back to school. And at Emmaus, we've realized that that's kind of like putting the cart before the horse, if you will. We, you really have to work to 
build up their self-esteem uh, and help them cope with the trauma that they're facing before they can a they're able to define their own aspirations and reach these goals. Emmaus Explorers and the new Duville Empowerment Project that Gretchen and I have both mentioned align perfectly with this new mission. Uh, fourth, uh, this project would not be a success without the support from the executive leadership and the board of directors at Emmaus. From the beginning, we tried to engage our executive director in key decisions and invited her to strategic planning sessions along the way. At the end of each term, the VISTAs gave uh, an internal presentation about the program's impact. As a result, our executive director loves the project and has been instrumental in helping us expand to include the new parental programming. In fact, when she has speaking engagements or public meetings, our executive director often uses Emmaus Explorers as an example of the good work that Emmaus is doing in the community. Finally, I encourage you all to be realistic when setting uh, goals for projects and designing programs. For Emmaus, the population we serve is very fluid, as Gretchen mentioned. We can't anticipate what families will be in the shelter and what the activities they will be interested in. To account for this, Emmaus Explorers was designed to be friendly and accessible to new families. Families can sign up on the spot and there's no requirement for attendance. By removing barriers to participation, we have helped ensure the program's success. Additionally, I encourage you to remember that simple is often more sustainable. Programs don't have to be wildly ambitious or elaborate to have a lasting impact. They just have to be well designed and easy to implement. Well, that pretty much sums up my suggestions. Uh, Gretchen, what do you think? Do you have any more? There's a few more, Katie. Um, understanding the project's funding needs and determining likely funding opportunities. And I noticed early on some of the comments in the chat section from the VISTAs about sustainability. The comments were fabulous, and several of you mentioned funding. And funding is a reality. I mean, we, you need to look at your project. What we did this winter with the Explorers program, and we were looking towards developing this second companion program for adults, and we looked at it, and we sat down, and we said, what are all the costs involved in this? Not just the cost of, oh, if we hire a program coordinator, we increase the number of hours of the coordinator. Not just staffing, there's so many other costs. There's facility costs involved, um, there's food and supplies. You know, you're doing programming with kids, you've got to have something for them to do. You have arts and craft supplies. And a lot of those things we are thankful we can get in kind gifts, um, contributions of those items. But you can't count on that when you, you have to do a realistic budget. If nobody gave you anything, what would this cost? What would it cost to run the copy machine? What would it cost to have telephones? What would it cost to insure your program? Um, liability insurance, you have to look at all of that, you know, your administrative overhead. Um, and you, once you do that, then you get a sense of, okay, this is what we're really talking about. And then you can start looking for funding sources. Um, and of course, we all love to think we're gonna get giant foundation grants and Katie and I have tried, we're trying to get some of those for this project. Of course, for in our case, we have two VISTAs now that are coming into the mix that are going to be sources of revenue for this project, in-kind support for this project. But it's really important um, right from the beginning to have that in mind because your project's gonna be doomed to fail if you don't think forward about the funding because at a certain point, you'll no longer have buy-in from the executive leadership and board of directors if the program's losing a lot of money, even if it's very successful and it's having great outcomes. It's got to be self-sustaining so it's not a drain on the organization financially. Next, I would say effective staff and volunteers. I just wanna say that um, this project never would have happened without Katie and her two fellow VISTA members um, who are part of her team. They really were the driving force behind the development of this project. And they were brilliant, they were dedicated, they were hardworking and ambitious, and they had a can-do attitude. And really, to make VISTA projects sustainable, that's what you need. And you need staff in the organization to carry that on. Um, I'm very dedicated. 
Katie will tell you that, that, you know, I've been fighting poverty for 30 years, but I still have some fire in my belly to keep fighting. And we have a lot of great volunteers. And so now Katie's a staff member here too. I mean, it is, we are in a business where human resources are essential. It does make a difference. It, projects will not be successful if people have a laissez-faire or lackluster attitude about them. So you've got to really, when you, you're looking in all of you as VISTAs, you don't have control necessarily of who's going to take over your projects. But whatever influence you have, if you see people in the organization that may be talented, um, our VISTA team, Katie's team, saw someone at our family shelter who was a part-time staff and said she would be great to be the project coordinator. So she became the project coordinator and they advised me and I went to our program managers and, and our executive director and that happened. So be mindful of that and look around and think of your project and think who would you entrust it to? Who would be capable? What volunteers do you have who are superstars? That's really important. Similarly, as I said before about funding, when you're looking for funding, you need to think of non-staff resources. What do you need? You need adequate space. You know, you need to have all of that in mind. It's really super important. And um, I think Sarah's mentioned in the holding up the chair, how important the community stakeholders are and the community partners. You know, for us, um, we've involved all of these community partners in the Emmaus Explorers program. So that's been a way for us to really build our relationships with other organizations. And to be honest with you, to keep us fresh, we've been in existence 30 years. Everyone knows we do shelter. Everyone knows we help people find housing. But now we have something fresh. When people say what's new at Emmaus, I have something new to tell them about. And they're really impressed. They see us meeting another need. And that's really good for the organization's public relations and the morale. It's, it's just so important to, for people to be constantly looking to the future of doing new things. And lastly, continually measure success and make ongoing adjustments to your project. As Katie said, we at Emmaus have recognized that perhaps we were rushing some of the families. We were running a high school equivalency program, um, a high set in Massachusetts, it's called high set test and we were running a program and we also had computer skills and we were finding the parents just didn't want to participate in that. And so what we did is we said, okay, we need to do something new. And so now we're doing the empowerment project for parents and we're going to really try to design the program around meeting their needs. And needs change over time. When we started the other program, it was very relevant and it's lost relevance. So we always have to be constantly sharpening our pencils and taking a look at what we're doing and taking our own, you know, personalities out of the mix and our own favorite pet projects out of the mix and saying, is this meeting a need, a defined community need in the best possible way with the amount of resources we're using? And if it's not, then you need to make adjustments. And that just about does it for our sustainability tips. Well, thank you, Katie and Gretchen. It was really great to hear from your experiences. So all of you on this webinar are probably working hard at building knowledge and products and relationships that will be key to the sustainability of your programs and organizations. And you may remember from your PSO that we define capacity building as the transfer of knowledge, products, or relationships. We heard some great examples from Katie and Gretchen of how they're doing this in their VISTA project. What about you? What are you doing to pass on the capacity you're building? We wanna hear from you. And we're just gonna take a couple minutes for this. Um, take a minute to share with each other some ideas that might be helpful to the group using the chat function that you're all quite familiar with now. Uh, name some examples of activities or practices that you're using or planning in order to transfer the knowledge, products, or relationships that you're building. All right, we've already got our first response. Um, Kat says she's gonna create a video legacy binder. Um, all right, we've got guidebooks, uh, how-to, uh, handbooks and materials, um, writing down everything that I do, all the outreach. 
um, and advocating for a new VISTA sponsor. Um, so lots of great ideas coming in. Keep those coming. Um, Sarah, I'm going to see if any of those jump out for you, and then um, we can move on. Okay. Well, I'm definitely seeing some of those tried and true things about manuals and binders and templates. These are great. Um, I'm going to, as those continue to come in, run through just briefly a few more ideas that might be useful to you in passing on your work. Uh, we heard some good examples from Katie and Gretchen, like about passing on knowledge, like the activity bank that they named. Um, you might also pass on knowledge by creating asset maps or doing stakeholder analyses. These are ways of representing the knowledge that you've gained so that others can build on it. If you're doing research or identifying resources, there are a lot of different ways that you could document and represent those. And your supervisor can help you identify a format, whether that's written or electronic or on a web page, that will be accessible and useful to others. Also, stories are important. The stories of people who've been affected by your program, of people who've invested in your program or are volunteering with your program, they can be used by others in many ways. Get those recorded, get them written. As Katie described, making presentations to organizational leaders and staff that connect your program to the organization's goals and effectiveness are an important way to pass knowledge on. And you can identify or create opportunities to share what you've learned with others, partners, the community at large. If what you're creating are products, you've heard this over and over again, try to do it from the start with the end user in mind. Instead of creating something for yourself and then handing it off, think of what it's like to be in the role of the end user. That's why we asked if you can identify them. The one who will use the products after all the vistas are gone and design it to be useful for them. You can, once you've identified those folks, you can be doing training with them, working with them one-on-one. -on -one. You can create step-by-step -step guides to help them carry your work forward. Templates, as Katie described, to make tasks easier. And of course, many of you have already talked about uh, collecting things, whether physically or electronically. Uh, you know, lots of possibilities for shared electronic resources. Um, I know that you want to make sure people get comfortable with them. I, I'm part of a volunteer-led organization where I'm pretty much constantly helping folks learn to access our Google Drive folders. And of course, you want to make sure that you leave behind anything like usernames or passwords that others might need after you're gone. If you're building relationships, here again, you can't wait for the last minute. You need to lay that groundwork from the beginning. Of course, you're going to want to build and pass on a detailed database with notes so people understand how to communicate with them and what their roles are. But it's also important that you be intentional from the start about building relationships so that they're identified with the organization or the program, not just you as an individual. In one organization I volunteer with, we never meet with community leaders individually. It's always two or more of us so that the relationship is identified with the group rather than individuals. You'll want to connect them to staff people. A staff person may need to bridge the gap even if another VISTA is coming on board. You can do this one-on-one, -on -one, make introductions, set up meetings. You can also connect um, folks to staff and your organization through events like recognition and celebration events or by involving staff in training sessions or meetings. You could also create or formalize something like a community advisory board or the volunteer leadership program that Gretchen mentioned. And if you work with organizational partners, you can work with them and the staff of your organization to create written agreements, written memoranda of understanding that articulate the partner's roles and responsibilities in as much detail as possible. So now with all those ideas in mind, I just want to ask you one last question. 
Imagine that you'll be the very last VISTA at your organization. Put in the chat box at least one action that you'd need to take to ensure that your work will continue after the project ends. All right, so looking for your specific action steps, um, even just one action that you can take uh, to make sure that your work is going to continue after you're gone, uh, documentation. So that's the theme that's mm -hmm. emerging here, making sure it's written down, making sure it's accessible, making sure others can find it. Uh, organizing, making sure that materials are organized and that people can find them um, and that they make sense. Um, yeah, Binder, of course, is a great uh, a great format for that, um, oh, setting goals. So going back to the planning piece and making sure that the goals um, are, are clear and articulated um, and that people understand what you're trying to accomplish. So great, looks like uh, you guys are really picking this up um, and you've figured out what, what it means for your own VISTA service. Um, Sarah, anything stand out for you? Well, I, again, I feel like we've got so many great connections and uh, ideas flying here that I'm hoping some of those connections are going to be sustainable. And we do have a few more immediate next steps to throw out here. Uh, brainstorming with your supervisor about how your VAD objectives connect to long-term sustainability for your program and reviewing the resources that uh, we've seen so far both on the webinar and that what you've been sharing with one another as well. You can just simply make a list of the capacity you're building that needs to be transferred so that you've got a starting place for a plan to transfer that capacity. And then uh, last week we held a webinar on sustainability for supervisors. If your supervisor missed it, you could encourage them to look at the recording that you can find on the VISTA campus. All right, those are some great next steps, Sarah. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And um, we're going to get to your questions in just a moment. But before we do, um, I want to point out we've opened our evaluation poll. It's uh, available there on the right side of your screen. So if you would take a moment, you'll have to use the scroll bar to get to all the questions. There's 10 quick questions. Um, I'm really interested to know not only what you think about this session, but also if you have topics for other webinars, you know, beyond sustainability, what other uh, topics would interest you, what other skills are you looking to develop, so that as we're creating new sessions, we can work that in. Um, and now we're going to get to your questions. So uh, you know there is the Q&A panel. It's now just above the poll that's open, so it's, uh, it's collapsed. You'll have to click the little triangle next to Q&A to open it up. And I'm going to invite our operator, Kevin, to come back on and give us instructions for asking questions by phone. Kevin? Thank you, sir. At this time, if you would like to ask any questions over the phone lines, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. Be sure your phone line is unmuted, and please state your name at the prompt so we can announce your name prior to you asking your question. Again, that is star, then one on your touchtone phone. Terrific. And while we're waiting for questions to, to come in by phone, we've already got a couple here in the Q&A, so we're going to start there. Um, and, uh, and I'll just remind everybody, we have still with us on the phone, we have uh, both Gretchen and Katie from the MAS Rebuilding Lives AmeriCorps Vista program, as well as Sarah Gleason. So I'm going to be fielding some of these questions to, to different presenters based on who I think might be um, uh, good to, uh, to do. So we'll start with Sarah on this question. It comes from Becca. She asks, how do you create sustainability in an organization that has only two people? That is a great question, and I definitely know where you're coming from. And, you know, part of that answer to me has to do with uh, continuing to expand the circle of people who are involved, even if they're not going to be able to be involved full time. The more that you can build the base of people who see themselves as stakeholders or owners or, you know, really care about the program, 
the more that you're going to be building sustainability in that way. Of course, that's a, also a very big question that you asked, and I know that that's not only just one little piece of the answer. Yeah, and Gretchen, I'm wondering if you have anything to add uh, to, to Sarah's thoughts about creating sustainability in a very small organization. Well, I think it all comes down to engaging other people, um, you know, as volunteers, getting those community partners, community stakeholders involved. I agree with that. I think that when you're that small, you know, for example, Emmaus initially it was started off, but it was a coalition of people were concerned because we saw homelessness growing in Haverhill. Um, so right from the beginning, there were no paid staff, and you know, and then we we were able to pull that together to create an organization. So the circles, as Sarah said, the circles got to keep getting wider and wider in order to draw people in. You know, the expression "grow or die." I hate to use it, but um, I think with just two people over time, it would be incredibly difficult to sustain the organization. So you, you have to grow the circle. Great. Um, our next question comes from Joan, and uh, this is a question I think maybe for both Gretchen and Katie. Um, Joan says, the process and curricula that Emmaus has developed would be very useful at my organization. How much of the material is on their website, and who would be a good point person for me to follow up with questions? Um, I can start with that, and then Katie can join in if she sure. has something different to say. Um, what I would say about that is we don't have the information on our website right now um, for many reasons. One, it is proprietary, um, and you know we're trying to build a program here and attract funding to it, so we don't want it just to be like publicly on the website. But if Joan got in touch with us privately, and certainly um, you have, you know, our you can in the chat section send us a private message now, and we can give you our telephone numbers or email addresses. If you want to get in touch with us privately, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, uh, I agree. Um, as Gretchen mentioned, the information isn't on the website, but I know I personally would be very happy to talk to anyone um, who thinks they could learn from our project. Um, we did a similar thing when we were designing the project. Uh, we reached out to organizations like the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA and YWCA and Horizons for Homeless Children and tried to see what we could learn from their program successes. So it would be great to uh, continue that trend and I would be happy to um, talk to anyone. Great. Well, thank you both for that generous offer. And um, now I'm going to turn to Kevin see if we have any questions on the phone. At this time, I am showing no questions. But again, if you would like to ask a question over the phone lines, please press star, then one on your touchstone phone. Okay, great. Well, we've got a few more here, so we'll keep moving. Um, and uh, this next uh, question is also for Gretchen and Katie, or actually for Katie. It says, hi, Katie. First of all, congratulations on all your success in developing and implementing programs. Particularly, I was wondering if you did any research, like focus groups, to understand what programs you wanted to develop. How did you establish trust with them? I guess she's meaning with uh, the, the homeless families that you're serving. Awesome. Well, thank you, by the way, um, for congratulating me. Uh, it's very nice. But um, so. Before the original summer session, um, my VISTA team and I uh, surveyed both the families in the family shelter and the staff to see what sort of programming they would be interested in to see for the youth. And we also um, wanted to gauge um, interest in different like times of the day. We didn't know if it would be more effective to have a morning program or an afternoon program. And after conducting the survey, we realized that afternoon program were great um, and that people were especially interested in field trip activities and activities that combine the kids and the parents. So we tried to use those tips um, and that information when designing the program. Um, we also, in terms of trust, um, Gretchen mentioned that we recruited our program coordinator um, who kind of leads the activities every day and oversees the volunteers from within the family shelter staff. Um, and we thought that was really important. We wanted to um, 
have someone running the program that was familiar to the families. Um, her name was Suzette. She worked as uh, relief staff at the family shelter, so she already had a day-to-day -day interaction with the families, um, and so they, there was already a level of trust there. So being able to capitalize on someone like that was really instrumental to the program's success. All right. Thank you, Katie. Um, our next question comes from Beth, uh, and Sarah, I'm going to direct this question to you. So Beth asks, what resources would you suggest for sustainability of relationships and partnerships specifically? It seems like transferring a relationship to a new VISTA or to a staff member would be hard. Well, I think that that is true. I think that among these things we've talked about, that transferring relationships is probably the one that requires the most intention and attention. Um, so resources that I would suggest, and I'm not sure if I am understanding the question right. Uh, one resource that I would suggest for this and actually probably uh, many other topics, there's a an online bank of resources called the Community Toolbox that's maintained. It's uh, C T B dot k u dot e d u but if you just google community toolbox you'll find it and i know that there's a big section in there on building and sustaining relationships um there you know if we're talking about particularly um partnerships that actually in some ways can be easy more easy the easier uh to kind of get a handle on because if we're talking about organizational relationships, we can do things like uh, getting things clarified and written down in a way that it really links the two organizations rather than simply an individual to the organization. I know I mentioned the idea of, you know, the word is silly, memoranda of agreement, but uh, really kind of getting down to, you know, what do we see as our relationship and what are we, you know, is this just for a particular event? Is something is this something that we see going forward? And getting that clarified so that all partners understand. And that you would want to do with someone else from the organization in the room so that, again, it's not just you clarifying that. There are also a bunch of good resources for nonprofits on collaboration and I'm of course blanking on the particular one that I would point out but I will try to think of it and put it in the chat if I do. Sure. Well, we do have um, uh, a recorded webinar on uh, building effective partnerships and there is a whole list of associated resources around collaborations. There's a, a um, uh, assessment tool to see how strong and, and healthy your collaboration is. So there are a lot of resources there. Um, you'd look on the uh, webinars for VISTA's page of the VISTA campus. Um, look under uh, on-demand webinars and there's one there on partnerships. Um, so Kevin, anybody on the phone? At this time, sir, still showing no questions on the phone lines. Okay, no worries. We've got them here um, online. So the next two questions are, again, for our speakers from Emmaus. So Gretchen and Katie, first up, Carol wants to know, how do you maintain the interest of outside organizations that are participating in the Emmaus programs so that you don't lose them from year to year? Uh, well, I can start off with that one. Um, Emmaus is really um, a big part of this community. A lot of people, it's been here 30 years, and um, a lot of people, for example, the um, one of our cyclists for our Cycle for Shelter events, who has four children now, and he um, is a financial advisor, he, and he's in Rotary Club with me, he volunteered here as a teenager when he went to Havel High School. So we have all of this uh, social capital, so to speak, at Emmaus, and that really benefits us. And um, we have a great marketing and communications person. We do e-newsletters. We have a presence on Facebook. 
um, we really try to make people feel like they're part of our mission. And we're, we started off, as I said, a group of volunteers formed the organization. So we've kept that culture, that culture of openness and of being a community-based organization. You know, we um, provide housing and we work with people who have a lot of issues, a lot of disabilities, but yet we still kind of have an open door policy. It's not a, a particularly clinical kind of place. So our partners love to come here. I mean, I don't know if you want to add anything, Katie. Yeah, just uh, as you were just saying, Gretchen, um, I think inviting partners to come see what you're doing is a really great way. For the Explorers program specifically, the majority of partners that we're engaging are doing hands-on activities with the kids. Firefighters are coming and talking to the kids, or uh, as Gretchen mentioned, a karate studio comes and does martial arts lessons with the kids, or representatives from the YMCA do kids Zumba, or local artists will come and talk to the kids. So we're really engaging partners in a very hands-on way. So I think that's a really easy way to keep them interested. And even if that's not applicable to your program, just inviting them to see kind of the impact of what they're doing and what the partnership is offering and the impact that it has on the program can be really helpful. So yeah, just invite them to come take a look. And you can never say thank you enough. If you want people to come back, you've got to thank them and recognize their good work um, and their participation and, you know, really acknowledge that it made a difference. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, bringing those partners in, really engaging them is the key to keeping them. Akiko uh, has a related question. Uh, she says, I'd like to know how you approached community organizations. Do you know people working in those organizations already? Well, something that Sarah said early on about the um, evaluation study that was done on the VISTA program and it showed experience of the host organization was one of the key predictors of success. Emmaus is, as I keep saying, I mean, we, I've worked here, I was a founding member and I've worked here for uh, 21 years. So yes, we know a lot of people in the community. And But also I have to say, um, Katie and her VISTA team, they thought nothing of cold calling people too. Um, they were really bold that way. You know, they would just make calls and do the elevator speech about how great Emmaus was and how great the Emmaus Explorers program was. And of course you want to help us, don't you? And you know, their enthusiasm and their willingness to take a risk like that made a huge difference in bringing in additional partners that maybe weren't as familiar with Emmaus already. Great. Yeah, I would agree. It was great that Gretchen knew so many people, but I personally also found that um, community partners and donors and uh, both cash and in-kind donors have responded really well to the kind of youth and enthusiasm and new energy that we bring in as VISTAs. Um, so we always had really positive responses even when we didn't have that initial contact um, to rest on. All right, great, great uh, ideas there. Um, for those who haven't noticed, uh, Sarah did post a link in the chat um, to some collaboration resources that are available from the Foundation Center. So thank you, Sarah, for that. And, um, and Sarah, this next question is for you. Um, let's see. Uh, Marcel asks, what is the average life of a sustainable project? I do not have an answer to that question. <laughs> uh, you know, the study we looked at was specifically about VISTA projects, and it was looking at them three years after the last VISTA had left. But if the question is broader about uh, the average life of a sustainable project, I am not even sure where I'd begin to look for that data. Yeah, I think that is a hard question because some projects, um, you know, may be intended to be relatively short term and others, you know, may have a 10 or 20 year lifespan. Um, you know, whether they reach that milestone or not is, is a different question. Um, so uh, it's hard to know if there's an average lifespan. Um, but in terms of, you know, VISTA projects, um, what Sarah mentioned is right, the, the study that we did here at the Corporation for National Community Service a few years ago, 
you know, did look specifically in the VISTA context, and, and by and large, those projects were intended to last three years. Um, you know, the VISTA resources would be there for three, you know, sometimes four or five, but, um, but generally a relatively limited time frame, and then the study was done three years after that, looking to see what was still in place. So, um, but it's a great question. I'm sorry we don't have an easy answer for it. Uh, next up, uh, Joan wants to know, um, how do you prevent burnout in staff, and how could a VISTA member help with that? I can tackle Sarah? that. Oh, okay. Go it, go Gretchen, go right ahead. Well, just from my perspective, I know that having a VISTA members at Emmaus has really helped me from getting burnt out. As Katie mentioned, I mean, it's really great to ha have that infusion of youth and energy into your organization, and it's really exciting for staff, or for me as a staff person, to serve as a mentor and also to be able to teach, to be a teacher, to share what I've learned, um, to share my experiences with people who are so committed. I mean, what I find uniformly is people who get involved in the AmeriCorps VISTA program are really committed to social justice, to, to social change. I mean, and that's really great for me to be around that. So just having the VISTAs here helps to keep me from being burnt out. Now, with more practical things, for example, um, not this past winter, but the winter Katie was a VISTA. The, we provide housing at Emmaus, and they live right across the street from the building we work in. So when we had a, the huge blizzards, many of you probably know about the, that winter in Boston, um, it was so great for our staff because the VISTAs were able to come and help. Um, because it was an emergency, they were able to come and help, help serve meals and things when none of the staff could get in. So a few staff had to sleep here, but knowing we had the VISTAs to help probably kept one or two staff members from having to stay overnight here in that emergency situation. So, you know, stepping up to the plate when there's something really unusual that occurs and chipping in and having that willingness to help, what can I do, you know, and I mean, I think for the VISTAs it was meaningful too. Katie can tell me if it was or wasn't, but that was an example a of a way time. the VISTAs really proved their worth to, you know, the direct care people here. I knew their worth as capacity builders and the, and the processes they were developing. But for the average staff member here who does direct service, you know, to work side by side with them, that was a great way of them really proving their worth to the other staff members too. Wow, what a great answer. We couldn't ask for a better spokesperson um, for the value of this that can bring to an organization. Thank you, Gretchen. Well, it's all Sarah. genuine. I mean every word of it. Oh, I can tell. Sarah, anything you would add to that? Uh, only that another way I've seen VISTAs being able to help with burnout is uh, when those part of what the VISTAs are doing is really uh, helping the folks in the front lines to see the impact of what they're doing, gathering those stories, really feeding that back to them in a way that because just like with volunteers, with staff, the more that we understand the value of our effort, uh, the easier it is to keep on going. Great. Thank you so much. And Kevin, let's go back see, do we have anybody on the phone lines? Still at this time showing no questions, but again, if you would like to ask a question over the phone line, please press star, then one on your touchtone phone. All righty. Well, we are um, approaching the, the end of our time together um, and uh, hearing that we don't have anybody yet on the phone. Um, we've covered all the questions that have come in um, through the Q&A in WebEx. So um, I would like to give a huge thanks um, both to Sarah Gleason, our main presenter here, um, for all the research and development and, and um, uh, really uh, putting together such a great presentation, um, as well as to Gretchen Arnst um, and Katie Berry from Emmaus Rebuilding Lives AmeriCorps VISTA program for all of your um, presentation and, and um, the great experience and, and, and resources that you've shared today. Um, I do want to invite you to our next webinar that's coming up on May 12th 
Uh, it's called Managing Up, Improving Communication with Your Supervisor and Coworkers. Um, you will receive, if you haven't already, uh, an email invitation to that session. Of course, you can find it on the VISTA webinars page of the VISTA campus um, and click through to sign up. Um, so again, I want to thank you all for your participation today. It's been a really great session. Um, thanks again to our producers, um, Sam and Bethany, um, both at JBS International and Education Northwest for all the technical support. Um, thanks to our operator, Kevin. And most importantly, thanks to you, the VISTA members, for all that you're doing um, to make VISTA such a successful program. So thank you all, and we'll see you again very soon.